church. How you guys doing today? It's so good to see you guys. I want to do something before I take another step. Um, I want to just honor all of uh, you care workers and um, those of you that are working in um, doctor's offices, hospitals, if you're a doctor, all of you guys. I just want to right now, can we just show them some love? We love you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know this has been a long season for um, a lot of us, especially you guys um, that are serving in those, those areas, and we are praying for you. Uh, you just have some strength. I mean, we have so many of you that attend Neon Life Church, and, uh, and just hearing y'all's stories and everything that y'all are dealing with on the day-to-day basis, um, it just lets us be reminded that we do need to be pray- praying um, specifically for so many different um, people during um, all this stuff that's going on, and so we're praying for you. We love you so much. Pray that God gives you strength and, um, and just continued courage in, in, in what you're doing. So um, also, I uh, want to remind you guys, uh, really excited, Life Groups, our spring semester is launching on February 14th, everybody. You shouldn't forget that date. Men, you know what that date is? Uh, they're looking around, what is that? Okay, so that's a, that's a special date. We're going to make it easy on you guys. We're going to launch our life groups on a date that you need to remember. Uh, please don't forget, Valentine's Day. Uh, and so, because our groups are all about relationships and what better day to kick off our groups. I want to encourage you to get in a group. I want to encourage you guys that in our, in there, when our spring semester kicks off on that February 14th day, be here for that. We're also going to do something really exciting we've never done before because we do have, we have our life groups, but we all also have various ministries of Neon Life Church. Um, we have, we have um, men's ministry, we have youth ministry, we have our, um, we actually, we're, we're kicking off another ministry and we're going to be launching it on uh, Valentine's Day on this, on our group launch, but it's going to be called Care and Healing Ministry. And so we're working out the details on our website for that. Uh, uh, Pam Halford, man, she is awesome. I don't even know if she's in here right now, but she's an awesome leader and she has been, we've been trying to actually get this Care and Healing type ministry uh, rocking and rolling through our life groups. And I had to call her and just say, Pam, I'm so sorry. I've been forcing you to do this. Um, this uh, you're, you're, you're calling through this, these groups, and it ain't working. So we revamped it um, a few months ago and had, a long, had several long discussions about it. So we're going to be stepping back out and launching it as a ministry. So we're excited about that. There's going to be more to come. So just uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, for you life group leaders, that God is I know God's stirring your heart to lead a group. I don't even have to ask you. And so uh, the deadline for you to get your group online is February 8th. Uh, lead a group. Relationships are important. I'm, I'm going to be serious for a second. I believe that this season of groups, we do a 10-week semester, but this season coming up of life groups is the most vital season that we, that we have had. Um, simply because of everything that's going on, I, the enemy is attacking on so many spiritual fronts, and, uh, and there's nothing better than just those relationships of getting together you know, I told first service that in the fall group, it was, uh, it was the, the elections took place on a Wednesday, and our group that, that I attend is on a Wednesday. And, and so if you remember the turmoil of revolving around the elections, I don't know if you forgot that or not, but um, we, we showed up that night, and, you know, there was no, um, they didn't have any results or anything. And so we're all kind of, kind of a little bit like, oh, man, you know, kind of a little down and, um, you know, a uh, little stressed about it. And um, I remember by the end of that group, we weren't even thinking about elections or anything we were we just were laughing and having a great time and we walked away with just joy in our heart and man I can't I can't tell you how much you need the environment of our life groups I just need to tell you just get in a group and discover that for yourself you don't know how much you need it until you get in there and you realize it I'm just I'm just telling you you need those and uh, and so February 14th we're kicking off our groups also the first Saturday of every single month we call it um, growth track but you can call it our membership class but um, it's it's where you learn all about Neon Life Church and God's plan for you uh, I believe that uh, God has a vision for you and so what we like to do is because uh, God doesn't really have I mean the institution of Neon Life Church hey this is just a church but whenever whenever I look at you it's you're the church you're the capital C church. So God has a mission for you. God has a plan for you. And so our heart for Growth Track is just to kind of help you see what that is. Like, hey, if, you know, when you attend the online church, here's God's plan for you. I mean, we want to help you discover your purpose. We want to help you, um, we want to help you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference in this world. I believe that's our, every one of our callings uh, in life. I believe that's why God put breath in our lungs is to make a difference in the world. So sign up for Growth Track. You can do that with the card in your seat back or online. One more thing, everybody. We're two weeks into our 21 days of prayer and 
fasting. Oh, I love it. I'm going to tell you, if you haven't been a part of our 21 days of prayer and fasting and you're thinking, oh, man, they're already two weeks down. i got one week to go. I'm just going to set this one out. Don't do that. Jump in anytime, any place. I promise you, uh, every single uh, Monday through Friday, we're getting together. We're meeting at Mount Pleasant Community Center from 6 to 7 a.m., and we are just going after God. We're believing God for some mountain-moving um, uh, prayers, and, and I, I'm telling you, your, your life has changed. When you combine your prayer with fasting, Man, I'm telling you, mountains begin to move and waters begin to part and giants begin to fall. And so in Jesus' name, I'm, I'm praying. And if you can't join us at, at Mount Pleasant in person, I, I, love, I love the in-person gathering. I really do. But I understand a lot of you had different schedules. If you can't do that, then find a time uh, for an hour every day this week and, and just pray and seek God and believe God for some mountain moving prayers. We got prayer guides on the table out there to help you during your prayer time. And we also got, we just introduced for this 21 days of prayer and fasting, kids' prayer guides. Some of you adults may like that better than the, than the adult prayer guides. I personally do. There's pages to color and all sorts of things. No, seriously, they are great prayer guides. Grab, grab some of those on your way out, church. Uh, your kids will love them and grab some for you. Um, you'll need those. Uh, and they're, they're great for any time of year when you're praying. All right. So, uh, so today we're, uh, we're on our second week of the series that we're calling uh, The Holy Spirit. I think it's uh, very... It's, it is a very, um, well, I, it's strategic that I put this series in where it is right now with everything we're seeing in our world. I think that what better, um, what better part of God do we need in our faith right now than, than God's greatest gift for our faith, and that is the Holy Spirit. So um, this series is just my heart just trying to help you understand who, who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit has come to do, that there's power in the Holy Spirit. And I think that uh, oftentimes what we do is we bring our own re religious, uh, our own denominational backgrounds into our understanding of the Holy Spirit. We bring our own experiences into the understanding of the Holy Spirit. So what I've been asking you to do is leave those at the door. Like you may have a denominational background and this is, what, this is how you see the Holy Spirit and, and you may have an experience regarding surrounding who the Holy Spirit is and so I, because a lot of times they're, they're not healthy for us. And so what I'm asking you to do is leave all that stuff at the door to open your heart up and give me this time during this series to teach you who the Holy Spirit is. And so to kind of help you understand the differences of um, our denominational backgrounds, I, I've got some how to change a light bulb jokes, everybody. And, uh, and just to let you know, I've, I wrote three of these myself, everybody. So um, I'm not going to tell you which ones. I, I didn't tell first service. I'm just going to let you guys um, just imagine which ones I probably, probably wrote myself. But uh, when I did, I, I shared them with Crystal. I go, hey, guess which ones I wrote myself. It was really good. Anyway, I was so proud of myself. But uh, So check it out. Um, here we go. Don't, don't, don't hate on me for this either. This is just for fun. But uh, how many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? Change. Who said anything about change? <laughs> how many Charismatics does it take to change a light bulb? Only one because their hands are already in the air. Uh, how many Episcopalians does it take to change a light bulb? Ten. One to change the bulb and nine to say how much they like the old one. Uh, how many Pentecostals does it take to change a light bulb? Ten. One to change it and nine to cast out the spirit of darkness. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> how many Catholics does it take to change a light bulb? It doesn't take any, y'all. They use candles. Don't you know that? Come on. Uh, how many Church of Christ people does it take to change a light bulb? None, because light bulbs are not mentioned in the New Testament, and therefore they are unbiblical. <laughs> oh, I love y'all so much. I'm glad y'all are laughing. Um, here, I got some other ones that are, that are uh, not um, church-related. Here's some, uh, how many chiropractors does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, one, but it, it'll take you six visits to do it. <laughs> How many musicians does it take to change a light bulb? A one, a two, a one, two. <laughs> okay, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, How many teenage girls does it take to change a light bulb? It's going to take one, but it's going to take them about five hours because of all the selfies they're taking with it. And then they got to come up with the perfect social media post about it. <sighs> <Ugh>. <laughs> how, many, 
How many, uh, y'all, y'all parents related very well to that one too. <laughs> You're like, yeah, not just teenage girls, like my 11-year-old, man. Um, how many introverts does it take to change a light bulb? Just one. I don't want anyone else there whenever I do it. Uh, how many fishermen, the last one, how many fishermen does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know, man, but that light bulb was that big. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, so um, I'll let you guys speculate on which ones I actually wrote. I wrote three of those, so I am very proud of myself because y'all laughed on every one of them, so apparently <laughs> I'm funny. <laughs> okay. So, so today, um, I just want to encourage you guys, regardless of your, your background, regardless of your denominational background, your experiences that you might, because this is me, uh, you know, um, for a number of years, I really pushed away the person of the Holy Spirit because of the way that I had seen him packaged by people. And, um, and, 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 I, and my heart for you, my hope for you is that you wouldn't do that, that you would come here with a clean slate a blank page, and you would just open your heart and, and surrender to him. As a matter of fact, that is my prayer, that you would just surrender to him, that you would just say, today, God, I just, I just make a choice. I'm just going to open my heart up to you. I think that one of the most important things that we have to understand about the Holy Spirit is we're not going to be able to always make sense. Like, it does, like you know, okay, God, I'm going to let you in, but you got to behave yourself. I don't know what you're going to do in there, but you, you know, don't, don't do nothing crazy foolish or make me look, like, look, look weird or something like that. Remember, the, um, the Holy Spirit's not weird. People are weird. All right? So, um, so we have this verse of Scripture uh, in Acts 19, 1 and 2. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Then he found some disciples, some Christians, some believers, some followers of Christ. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they responded with, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit, which I think that that's the case today. I think that there's a lot of us that we're, we're coming to church and we love God, but we're not allowing God to do everything in our life that he wants to do, especially when it comes to the Holy Spirit. So last Sunday, what I did is I, I preached a sermon really um, I want it to be very simple, just almost like I'm making an introduction to you. Like I'm saying, here's the Holy Spirit. So my, my title last week was just, who is he? Who is the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit's not, a, not, a, not an it, not a thing, but the Holy Spirit is a person. And if you'll see him as a person, you'll relate to him personally. And that's important. If you'll see the Holy Spirit as a person, then you will relate to him personally. And so we learned what the word Holy Spirit or ghost means, that there's really no word in Scripture that spirit or ghost is not even the actual word. That it comes from the word ruach or pneuma, Old Testament and New Testament, ruach and pneuma, and the, and the word just means breath or wind, which is what the Holy Spirit is in your life, that the Holy Spirit breathes life into those lifeless places in your life. That the Holy Spirit is wind in your cells whenever you, whenever you need him. That the Holy Spirit, whenever you're down, the Holy Spirit lifts you up. Whenever you need someone to stick with you and be beside you, the Holy Spirit's always there. He's, he's always there with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. The Holy Spirit is always there. He comforts us. He guides us. He gives us wisdom. And my hope is that you would open your heart up and allow him in your life. So today, what I want to talk to you about today is something I think that we um, have a... We've painted a bad picture of, and it's the word Pentecost or Pentecostal. And so when we, when we think of those words, we, we might think, oh, well, Pastor Brown, I know what that means. That's, that's, that, that's that preacher that comes on at 3 a.m., you know, on that television show, and he's got the white suit on and the big fluffy hair, and he's got the rings on. And he says, if I'll give all my money, then you'll send me a little, little vial of oil. And, and, and No, that's not the word at all. As a matter of fact, we see the word in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And it said, says, when the day of Pentecost came. So Jesus came, spent 33 years with us, gave his life, died on the cross, went to the grave, came out of the grave, spent the next 40 days popping in and out of walls and talking to people and ministering to people. And, and then in Acts chapter 1, he ascends back up to heaven. Disciples... There was like 120 in all. You thought there was just 12. There was a lot. There was 120 in all. They're in the upper room. Ten days later, God sends his Holy Spirit. So 50 days after that. Now, something that's very important for us to understand about what Jesus came to do. I'm going to go back in, to a verse that I had actually skipped, just preparing you guys in the back. Um, Jesus 
did not come to do away with God's laws and commandments. That everything Jesus did was to fulfill the entire book of the Old Testament. I think a lot of times we think that, oh, well, Jesus came to do away with them. Like somehow they're not important anymore. But no, listen to this verse of scripture. I'm going to go back to Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 2. It says, while, yep, not that one. I'm not even going back. I'm going forward. Sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm just totally like, so we're going to go forward. Matthews 5 and 17. It says, don't, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law. That's the first five books of the Bible. Uh, of Moses or the writings of the prophets. That's the rest of the Old Testament. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. So the re- reason why we as Christians, we don't celebrate um, Jewish holidays or, or, or days or events or things like that is um, because when Jesus came, he, he established those in our heart. So now we're literally walking, talking, living, breathing examples of God's plan in our lives. And so now I want to back up, put Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Sorry, I'm jumping around. Acts 2 and 1, back on the screen. It says, when the day of Pentecost came. So the day that the Holy Spirit came, that whenever Jesus ascended up into heaven in Acts chapter 1, and in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit, we see this, we see this Pentecost happen. Acts chapter 2. It was on the day of Pentecost, whenever that took place. So Pentecost is actually a Jewish holiday. It's an event. It's a day. It's not, it's not um, a crazy church service. It's not swinging from the rafters. It's not running around and acting crazy. It's not crazy church services. Pentecost is actually a Jewish holiday. And so Jewish celebrate, they celebrate seven holidays throughout the year. Three of them are major holidays, kind of like we have Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Easter. They have, they have three major ones every single year that's called Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And so I want to explain to you what Pentecost means, but in order to do that, I need to explain all three. And so the first one I need you to understand is the one that's called Passover. And so Passover is the celebration of whenever God freed his people out of Egypt. And a lot of you probably know the story, but for those of you that don't, um, God's people, the Hebrew people, were going through a famine. And so to, to save themselves, they went into Egypt. And while they were there, they were enslaved by the Egyptians for the next 400 years. And so God wanted to set them free. So in order to, to convince Pharaoh and the Egyptians to let them go, God sent 10 plagues. The last plague was to kill the firstborn son of every family. But God said, I don't want my people to suffer any loss. And so God gave him specific instructions. God said, take the, take the blood of a lamb, kill the lamb, put it on the top of the door frame and on the sides of the door frame. Whenever my spirit comes by and sees the blood of that lamb, I will pass over. And so God said, I want you to celebrate this. I want you to always remember this. And so he, he had a celebration. So here's what they do. Here's how they would celebrate it. Uh, there's three things. The Passover lamb was sacrificed at 9 a.m., The lamb was then put in the oven at 3 p.m. And the sacrifice covered their sins. So remember, uh, Jesus came not to do away with the laws or the celebrations or the uh, Jewish holidays. Jesus came to fulfill them in the New Testament. And so I want you to look at the similarities of these. Because when Jesus entered Jerusalem to give his life on the cross, he entered because it was time for the Passover To take place. And so when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, it was the Passover. Now, watch how Jesus fulfilled this. So, Jesus was sacrificed at nine o'clock in the morning, same time as the lamb was to be sacrificed. And Jesus is known as the Lamb of God. We all know that. Jesus was then put in the tomb. They put the lamb in the oven. Jesus was put in the tomb at 3 p.m. Sorry, I actually missed one on the previous one. The the first one, let me just tell you real quick. And what that represented, don't go back, but what that represented is that sacrifice in the Old Testament, it covered over their sins. Like it didn't do away with it. It just simply covered it. Like the sin was still there, but they just like put a blanket over it and just just kind of covered it. But Jesus comes along, gives his life at 9 a.m., goes to the tomb at 3 p.m., and then instead of his, his death on the cross covering our sins, He removes our sins completely, takes away all of our sins. So what Passover represents is Passover represents salvation. Passover represents salvation. Now, I need you guys to understand that this one stands all on its own, that it's completely free. 
that no amount of works can do this. That you can't, you can't come to church enough, you can't read your Bible enough, you can't pray enough to be saved. That this is completely free. It is a gift from God. Let me show you. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says it's for, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from anything you did yourself. This is not from yourself. It's not from any works on your part. You can't earn it. You can't do anything to get it. It is a gift of God, not by works. So that no one can boast. No one can say, oh, I did that. I saved myself. No, you didn't. All you have to do is surrender to it. All you have to do is receive that gift of salvation in your life. But God has more for you. So you need to understand that it doesn't stop at the cross. It starts. Your faith starts at the cross. Your journey that God has for you, the cross, the Passover, that's the first part of the journey. But God has so much more. And so the next uh, major holiday that that Jewish people celebrate is called Pentecost. And so um, Pentecost is that, that celebration of after God led his people out of Egypt, 50 days to the day, 50 days later, they came to a mountain called Mount Sinai. We know the story where Moses goes up the mountain. We've seen the, the movie with, uh, what's his name, Charlton Heston, and goes up the movie, and there's the smoke and the tablets and the earthquakes and the fire and the bolts of light. There's all that stuff going on, a lot of loud noises. Now, look what took place on this right here. Well, hang on, let me just back up a second. Um, because there's a lot of us that we have like this... Uh, idea of what Pentecost or Pentecostal means. And so before we go any farther, I want to share with you what this means and hopefully dispel, because I believe the enemy causes us to be fearful of things that aren't even scary, to keep us from some of God's greatest, greatest things, being Pentecost, power, like it's, there's power in it, everybody. And so literally the word Pentecost, uh, penta, literally just means five. It's like a, a pentagon, like has five, it's a five-sided shape. There's penta and then cost, or coste means to the, to the tenth power. So literally, get ready, the word Pentecost means 50, everybody. That, is, that not, is that not just blow your mind? Like, is that not just terrifying? Oh, man, like run for your life, that's so scary. Pentecost, everybody, it just means 50. So I want you to look at what took place on this. I want you to look at the, what happened. So a cloud descended... <coughs> With a loud noise and fire, a cloud descended with loud noise and fire. And then man, so Moses uh, ascends up the mountain to go to God. And then God writes his law on tablets of stone. Now remember the story whenever Moses comes back down the mountain, he saw his, his dingbat brother Aaron down there. He had put together a golden calf and people were down there just worshiping the golden calf. And so 3,000 people died that day. God killed 3,000 people, I know. It's the Old Testament. Just read it. A lot of blood, a lot of guts. It's crazy. So now we jump ahead 1,200 years to the day. 1,200 years to the day, we see Jesus had given his life on the cross, and he had ascended up into heaven. And now we're at the day of Pentecost. It's 50 days to the day of whenever Jesus came out of the grave. 50 days to the day. 50 days to the day of whenever God led his people out of Egypt to Mount Sinai, 50 days to the day. Now it's 50 days to the day of whenever Jesus came out of the grave to um, the day of Pentecost that we see in Acts chapter two. Now I want you to look at the similarities here. Now on the first one, a cloud descended with a loud noise and now 1,200 years later to the day, the Holy Spirit descended with a loud noise and fire. We see that. It's in Acts chapter two, just read it. Uh, And then God, I love this part because man didn't ascend up to God like Moses goes up to the mountain to meet God, this time God descended down to meet man. I love that. And God didn't write his law on stone tablets, but God wrote his law in our hearts. And the most beautiful part is we see in the Old Testament where 3,000 people were killed, but in 1,200 years later to the day, 3,000 people were saved. I mean, it's, it's, it's powerful. Acts chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. It says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs. So Jesus comes out of the grave 40 days, and he's, he's walking around. He's saying, hey, look at my hands. It's me. Look at, look at my side. It's me. I'm the one that died on the cross for you. He's showing many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them, different people, over a period of 40 days. Well, pastor, I thought you said it was 50. Here it is right here. 
And then, and then Jesus, uh, on one occasion, while he was eating, so that's the last supper he's referencing, um, he gave the disciples this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait. Now, that's the 10 days right there because from the point Jesus ascended to the point of Acts chapter 2 where the Holy Spirit comes down, it was 10 days to the day. But wait 10 days for the gift that my Father promised. I'm just going to pause there. I didn't even talk about this in first service. But if God has a gift for you, do you know that it has to be the most amazing gift ever? Like, I, if God looked down at me and said, Eric, I want you to know I have a gift for you. Can I give that to you? I'd be like, yeah. I'd be so excited to have that gift. And so oftentimes what we do is we don't even want that gift because it's like, okay, wait. What is it first? Like, does it have, what's the exchange policy on this? What's the return policy on this? You know, because what if I don't want it? What if I open up the gift and it's, and it's, and it's like, wow, you know, it freaks me out. Like, if God, I'm just going to tell you this. If God has a gift, if, if God says, enough for me is, if God tells me he has a gift for me, I don't even have to ask. Like, what is it? Is it good? I know it's good. Because we serve a good God. We serve an amazing God. We serve a powerful God. A God that loves you. A God that cares for you. A God that will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. His entire, everything God has ever done has been about you. Even sending his only son was about you. That I, I, I was just sitting there hearing God speak to me during worship saying, do you know, what, do you know I, I count you worthy? I'm sitting, here, I'm, sitting here thanking Jesus. I'm sitting here thanking Jesus for dying on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, so much that you gave your life for someone like me. And God said, don't you know that I call you worthy? The fact that I sent my son should let you know that you are worthy to be mine. And sometimes we question the very gift that God wants us to have. So God has given us this gift, which you have heard me speak about, Jesus says. For John baptized with water. Now, John is, uh, Jesus is referencing salvation at that point. But in a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because salvation is not enough. Go to the next one. You need power, everybody. Salvation isn't enough for you to live on. The cross is not, the cross is not enough for you to live out, live out your faith, everybody. You need power. Why? Because God has a mission for you. He wants you to be his witnesses in Judea, Samaria, Samaria Jerusalem, to the, ends of the, to the ends of the world. That God said, I, I've got a work for you to do. I've got something you need to accomplish. And salvation is just not enough for you to fulfill it. I need you to have more. There's more than just the cross, everybody. Now, I'm not downplaying what the cross does in our life. Because without the cross, we're not gonna, we don't have the Holy Spirit. So we need salvation first. But there is more for your journey, everybody. I see too many people get held up at the, at the cross. Can I just tell you something? Jesus is no longer at the cross. He's in heaven next to the Father. He said, I have to go up there. Because if I don't, I can't send you the most powerful part of your faith. And so because Jesus ascended up into heaven, we were able to have the Holy Spirit in our life, the power of Pentecost in our life. God said, it's so good. I need, I need my son to come back up here so I can send you the best part of your faith, something that's powerful. So what does Pentecost really mean? Pentecost isn't crazy church services. It's not, it's not swinging from rafters and it's not running around the building and um, it's not me acting crazy. Pentecost is the power for me to do what I can't do. Pentecost gives me the ability to fulfill what God has called me to fulfill and to do what God has called me to do. Y'all, there, there are some of you, your, your marriage, you, you need God's power in your marriage. You need God's power in your workplace. Like, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say some of you. I'm going to say all of you. I need God's power in my marriage. I need the power of God in my marriage. I need the power of God in every single thing, in every single day that I do. Men, you need the power of God, Pentecost power in your life. That, that whenever you go to work and guys are talking a certain way and, and you, you just, you know, you're like, man, I, I don't want them to not like me. 
And the Holy Spirit gives you the power to be who God has called you to be and stand firm in that. I love the power of God living in my life because he gives me the ability to do what I can't do. To be, like without him, I, I, without him I'm, just, I'm just human. I'm just normal, but with him, I'm able to live a supernatural life which is what God gives us the power to do, to not live naturally, but supernaturally. And so what, the, what Pentecost is, is Pentecost is the power for us to make a difference. It's the power to make a difference. And here's the third holiday that they celebrate, and it's one called Tabernacles. Now, there's another name for it that I actually like a little bit better, and I'll tell you why here in a second, but it's the Feast of Trumpets, and I'll tell you why here in just a minute. I can't play a trumpet. I've tried to play a trumpet, and it pretty much sounds like... Pfft, that, that's all it sounds like. So God bless you if you can play a trumpet. But I like the name trumpets better, and I'll show you why here in a second. But the, 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 the celebration of tabernacles, the Jewish holiday of tabernacles, is the celebration of the Hebrew people who wandered the desert for 40 years, and, and they had temporary homes. They didn't have any, any permanent homes, and they lived, they lived in, in a tent, which actually what the word tabernacle means is a temporary home or a tent. And so God was taking them to the promised land. So that's the celebration of God, of them entering into the promised land. So look at this. Here's, here's some things we need to know about it. They were wandering and living in a temporary home. This is in the Old Testament. Until they were brought to their final home, the promised land. And then they celebrated this. This, uh, this celebration, tabernacles, was celebrated during the harvest season. So now, how is Tabernacles fulfilled in our lives today? And here it is, is that we are living on this earth, we are living in temporary vessels. This is not our, this is not our permanent home, that we also have a promised land until one day we'll be brought to our final home in heaven. But before that happens, there's going to be a great final harvest of people. Now, Joe, in the book of Joel, God says, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. And, and a lot of us are probably thinking, well, when's that going to happen? Because I think maybe when we see that verse of scripture, uh, we start thinking, okay, God, that's going to happen in like a matter of months or maybe in a year. We're going to see this obvious turning away from, from, from the world and people's lives and turning to you, God. We're going to see like, a, like just a huge swell of the church and, 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 and it's going to be something that's going to be obvious to us. But let me just tell you, in the last 20 years, we've seen more people come to Jesus, a relationship with Jesus in the last 20 years than in the previous 2,000 years combined. And so we're living in a, in a, in a great harvest day right now. There's more people that's come to Jesus in 20 years and in the previous 2,000 years combined. So is, is God coming back soon? I mean, he may, he may be. But whether you like it or not, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16 says, For the Lord himself, he's going to come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel. And here's where trumpets is. That's why I like it. With the trumpet call of God. That's where they get the other name for it. And then the dead... And Christ is going to rise first. I can't wait for this day, man. I don't know if I'm going to be the, the dead in Christ or the one that gets to meet the person, meet my grandmother, my grandfather back up in heaven, meet your mom and your dad. I don't know which side of this thing I'm going to be on, but I know I'm going to be on one side or the other, and it's going to be a glorious reunion. Either way, it's going to be amazing. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that, we who are still alive are, and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So tabernacles represents the second coming of Christ. So there's three major holidays that the Jewish people celebrate. Why? Because remember, Jesus came to fulfill the law. And so there's three things that God wants to do in our life. And the first thing is the Passover, salvation. That God wants, God wants you to know his son. God wants you to be set free. But it doesn't cost you anything. That No amount of your works can do it. It's completely free, and all you have to do is surrender to that. But there's more than just salvation. There's power, because God has called you to a mission. He's, he's got something out there he wants you to accomplish, and he needs you to have power to do that, power to make a difference until that one glorious day when we hear that trumpet, that I don't know why I did that, but I just wanted to, that's probably, it's probably going to sound way prettier and way louder than that. But so that one day, God, God calls us home, and we spend forever with him. Now, most of us 
are okay with the whole salvation thing. Like, we get that. We're like, okay, I, I, I know that. And then we have heaven, and we all get that too. We're like, because we, it gives us hope. It's our greatest hope. But a lot of times we struggle with, the, with the, the, the Pentecost part of this, the power part of this. And so I want you to understand that it's simple. Let me, let me read you this verse of Scripture in uh, Acts 2 and 12. They, they, they were looking around. This is Acts chapter 2 where they, the, the Holy Spirit has come down, and everybody's looking around amazed and perplexed. And so they asked one another, what does this mean? And it's simple. Like Pentecost is power, but not just any power. It's supernatural power. It's supernatural power that God wants us to have. So what I want to do is I want to give you just three things in closing, three areas that the Holy Spirit empowers me to live. And the first one is the Holy Spirit empowers me to live righteously. Now, remember in the Old Testament, we saw that when Moses went up the mountain, God put his laws and commandments on stone tablets. A lot of us are still living that way. A lot of us, you know, it's, it's, it's a real struggle. Like coming to church, serving, praying, reading God's word. It's a struggle. Look, I'm not coming down on you for it. I'm just, I'm just trying to help you understand why. Why it's a struggle. It's a real struggle. Why? Because those, those God's, who God is, like God's commandments are still written on stone tablets. Well, God comes along in Ezekiel 36 and 26 and he said, I want to take from you that heart of stone, and I want to put inside of you a heart of flesh. So when you surrender your life to God, no longer do his commandments become like you have to obey them. You become them. Like God writes them on your heart. Like serving God, um, coming to church, reading your Bible, prayer, it all of a sudden doesn't become a duty, but it becomes a delight. Like it becomes a joy. Like, God, I, I don't, it's not that I, like, God, I don't got to serve you. I get to serve you, God, today. Like, God, thank you. Thank you that I get to do this today, God. I get excited about our 21 days of prayer and fasting. I love, like, I mean, you know, prayer every day, but I, something, there's something awesome about coming together with people in a room at 6 a.m. You know what I mean? I, I hopefully, hopefully everybody's brushed their teeth. I'm not so sure about some of them, but maybe they have. Maybe I have it. I don't even know. I mean, hey, I might be the guy that hadn't brushed his teeth. I don't care. But there's, some, there's something really awesome about coming together with you at, 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 for prayer. There's something really great about, about coming here on Saturdays and, and setting this up. I love it. I really do. I enjoy it. I, I know, I, you're like, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to love Sundays, but this is my favorite day. This is what I love the most. My week, this is the highlight of, this is the highlight of my week. I look forward to this day. I really do. Because I get to come and be, be with you guys. We get to celebrate a great and awesome and powerful and wonderful God together. And there's something just incredible about doing that. And I love it. Like, it's a privilege. It's a, it, it, honestly, God, it's a privilege to get to serve God in so many different ways. And I love that. Why? Because God has written those things in my heart. And I cherish those things, and I love those things, and they're part of who I am. And it's, it's not that I even have to obey them anymore. I just, I've just become them because God has written them on my heart. He's taken that heart of stone away. Thank you, God, and given me a heart of flesh. Romans 8 and 9, I'll show you. It says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You're controlled by the Spirit if, so it's conditional, if you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. So when you have that spirit of God living inside of you and you surrender to him, it just becomes a pure joy to serve him. And you hear his voice. You want to know how to hear God? It's this right here. You surrender to him. Like you just, you just begin to hear that, that Jesus even said, when I send the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide to you. Isaiah 30, 21, one of my favorite verses of Scripture says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, hey, this is the way. Walk in it. The best part about God, the best part about the Holy Spirit is he speaks to us. Crystal and I had this happen in our, in, in our journey with God, like in ministry. You know, uh, whenever we felt God calling us to do something different, to, to step out of the, the place of ministry that, that, that we were at, and, and, and begin to launch this church. Whenever we did that, two other churches offered me a pastoral position, like pastoring their churches, two established churches, 
Churches, man, they had, they had a, look at this, they had, a, they had money and they had a building, everybody. Praise the Lord. Neon life was a, neon life was a thought. Like it was like, it was air. Like it was, there was nothing, everybody. And I've got these two other offers, the right, well, that's your right, the left or the right. I had these two other offers and God said, no, hey, this is the way. And you just hear God. And thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you speak so clearly. Thank you, God, that you got us. And you, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. Because I could tell you right now, if I did a pro, pros and cons list, Neon Life would not have won that one right there. No money, check. They got all the money. They got a building, check. We have not a building. We have nothing. We have nothing. But now, by the goodness of God, you know, God is awesome. God knows so much better than we know, and all we have to do is just trust him. He gives you the power just to live righteously, and he speaks to you, and he guides you, and he leads you. Here's the next one. is the Holy Spirit empowers you to live supernaturally. The God that created the heavens and the earth and the stars and the moon and created everything. Like, if you look at how, how, everything, how God created everything, it's crazy. Like it is so, there's so much perfection that goes into what God did. Like it's, it's amazing. The same God that did all that never intended for you to live normally. Never intended for you to live naturally. That God always intended for you to live a supernatural life. Like pretty much every single one of us would agree that Jesus lived a supernatural life, right? I mean, he's walking on water. He's raising people to life. He's, he's healing blind people. He's telling people, get up off that mat and walk. And none of us have a problem with that, right? Like, we're okay with that. But Jesus comes along and he reminds us of something too. He says in John 14 and 12, he says, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. Oh, that's crazy, okay. But they're gonna even do greater things than these. Like Jesus comes along and says, hey, you think what I do is awesome. When I send the Holy Spirit to you, you can do even more than what I've done. So I got a declaration for you that the same God who parted waters, the same God who slayed giants, the same God who healed the dead, the same God who healed the sick, the same God who gave sight to the blind, the same God that said, get up off that mat and walk is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Church, he has not closed up shop. He still does miracles and he wants to do a miracle in your life today, if you'll let him. <laughs> Worship team, you guys can go and come on up. Here's my last one. Is the Holy Spirit empowers you to live on mission. The Holy Spirit empowers you to live on mission. Now, I do not want to step on your toes because I love you so much. I really do. And I want you to always walk out your faith the way that, in, in the time that you feel comfortable doing that. But I want to share something with you. If you're here just to warm seats, you may feel uncomfortable at Neon Life. If you're here to just be here and just warm a seat. Now, I always will tell you if you're hurt, because a lot of times we come from a place of hurt and wounds, and we need you to be healed. We don't need you to jump in there too quickly. We want you to find that healing that God wants for you. But in the same aspect, there's a point where that seat starts getting hot. You've been warming it too long. And my heart is that you would never feel too comfortable in that place. Why? It's not because, y'all, we got a serve team of over 100 people. We have a phenomenal serve team. I'm just going to brag on y'all. You guys are amazing. We talked to two churches this last week, and they were asking us, like, how do you guys, how do you do it? Like, I don't know. Like, I guess, I don't know. I'm not paying them under the table or nothing. I'm, you know, I have no idea what's going on here. It's freaking me out a little bit too, but hey, I'm just going to go with it, right? So I just tell you, I mean, like, we don't need more people to serve. I want more people to serve. Like I do, I think God's kingdom needs more people to serve. So this doesn't come out of a, you know, like my own ambition. It comes out of my desire for you. Because I know that whenever you do get off that seat and you do start serving and you do start fulfilling God's call and you do start living out and depending on the power of God to live and work in your life, then your life begins to change. 
you begin to see God work. You begin to see the goodness of God. It's almost like God just makes you vulnerable just so you can, you can discover how powerful he truly is. It's the best part about God. There's nothing um, more vulnerable about me, uh, than me standing up here preaching in front of you guys for me. Like, this is my vulnerable place right now. Like, me being up here in front of y'all, I'm like, after church, you can ask my wife, I'm like, how was it? How'd I do? And she'll go, oh, you did so great. I'm like, yeah, you're my wife. Of course, you're gonna say that. I need to ask somebody that hates me. (laughs) Maybe they'll tell me the truth. But God does, he does. He strips us down and gets us to a place of where I need you to see how powerful I can be in your life. And that place is oftentimes where he's calling you out of your comfort zone, calling you to live out something that you have got to have his power to do it. He'll call you to do something that you cannot do within your own strength. And whenever that happens, you know you're going the right way and it feels awkward and it feels terrible and it feels uncomfortable and it doesn't make sense and nothing's working out. But God is calling you to a place where you have to walk on water. Otherwise, it ain't gonna be him. He's called you beyond beyond the shores, beyond the safety of the shores, everybody. He's called you out of the boat. He's called you into the storm. I believe this is the greatest time for the church right now. I look at 2020 and I think, man, what better time than for the church just to be the church? Like, man. Like there ain't no better time right now than to bring people to God because people are looking for him. They're hungering for him. They're longing for something different in their life. And if we don't take upon ourselves the power that was available at Pentecost, if we don't take upon ourselves the power that God has available to us, then we'll never make a difference in this world. God's called you to live on mission. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5. He said, our gospel came to you not just with simple words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. And that is my prayer for you, that that would be all of you. The Holy Spirit would burden you with deep conviction to go out there and win the lost, regardless of what it takes to change the world, to let God lead you to do it. Here's the last thing I wanna give you guys and I'm gonna close. But oftentimes what we do, what people, I've seen, I've seen people do this, is they will seek the Holy Spirit in their life. And when the Holy Spirit it comes into their life, they get arrogant about it, prideful about it. And they look down on other people. Like somehow like you're a lesser Christian than me because of who's living inside of me. And that has no teaching for this at all. It has no place in God's kingdom. If I could sum up to you guys who the Holy Spirit is in my life and what the Holy Spirit does in my life, the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. The Holy Spirit makes makes me better than me. Like I need Him. I need the Holy Spirit in my life. And you do too. So I wanna invite you just to stand to your feet. I wanna invite the prayer team to come down to the front. I'm gonna do two things today. The prayer team is up here for you. If you need prayer for any reason, you just come down. They're up here for you to pray with you, pray for you. If you need them for anything, you wanna come and pray, come on down right now. You can just walk on down while I'm talking. But today, if you need Jesus, if you don't know Jesus in your life, if you don't know who he is in your life, and today you wanna give your life to him, then I wanna invite you to that right there first. That first we have to receive Jesus first. So if that's you, I just want you to, I'm gonna invite you just to bow your heads right now. Let's all just bow our heads. And if you don't know Jesus, it starts at the cross. Let's give him our heart today. Just say, Jesus, forgive me. God, help me to be a better follower of you. God, thank you for giving your life on the cross. God, I pray that you would would take from me this heart of stone and give me that heart of flesh, one that beats for you. Jesus, thank you. Help me be a better follower of you in Jesus' name. Now, I want every person, if you're ready to invite the power of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit to live in your life, I want to just ask you just to stretch your hands out and say, Jesus, I invite the Holy Spirit. Just say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Just surrender. Just say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I welcome you into the way I speak, the way I think, the way I act, 
the way I live, the way I talk, the way I love. Holy Spirit, I welcome you into every area of my life. I welcome your power into my life. Your power into my life. Come on, just say that. I surrender. It's a simple statement. Just say, I surrender to you. I surrender to you. I surrender to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everybody. Come on, give God some praise. If you made a decision for Jesus, we'd love to know about it because we want to help you take another step in your faith. So there's a connection card there in your seat. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering box. Um, We're going to take just a moment and we're just going to stretch our hands and our hearts out and worship for a little bit longer. There's a prayer team up here in the front. If you need prayer, come on down to the front, everybody. Come on, let's worship. Come on, sing it out.